you're going to put in a place. How would you might like feel if you're going to put in a doll along with another 550,000 who are on the doll at the present minute? And when you know the coal in your pit, which we got out, and as far as I'm concerned, they're closing it for oil monopoly. How would you feel like if you worked in the industry all your life, gave that industry your lungs, and end up in the doll? Would you like it, pal? Well, we don't like it. We don't like it at all. We'll do something about it. Will you move to another area? Well, well, I get it, young one. 45 years old. 45 years old? Is that the end? Well, would you like to leave in 45? Pull up stakes and start again at 45, you know. So what is your future if the pit closes? If you don't want to move? Well, do all that's all. Let's have some more industries up. We're hoping to do. We're praying to do. <laughs> Bleak Monday morning in November, miners from the coal fields of Britain met at London's Marble Arch. Led by the Polkemit Pipe Band, these kilted bandsmen are all Scottish miners, they marched on Westminster escorted by the police. The purpose of the march was to win a reprieve from the policies of the Whitehall planners. The men who have never handled a lump of coal in their lives, except perhaps to throw it on the fire. The miners carried placards protesting against the further pit closures the further destruction of those mining communities where the life of the village depends on the life of the pit. Ashington in Northumberland has already felt the impact of the planner's iron fist, decently wrapped up, of course, in the velvet glove of the National Coal Board's manpower departments. Men have been made redundant here, and there will be more next summer. Pits have been closed, and a sure sign of worse to come, in the streets the Coal Board have been advertising jobs in other fields far away from Ashington. Four days after the miners marched in London, Lord Robins issued his grim warning to the industry that manpower in the coal fields would be cut by five men in every six over the next 12 years if government policy continued as planned. Though Lord Robins has done much to soften this blow to his men, many of them must leave the pits or go on the dole or move to other coal fields, like Alan Norman, who's decided to leave Ashington. He's worked in Ashington collieries for 11 years since he was a boy. He has a wife, one daughter aged seven, a comfortable house, a car, an interest in the territorials, and in his club darts team. Tomorrow, he's packing up and moving out with his wife and daughter. Behind him, he will leave his parents and his wife's parents. They're a close family in a very close community with its roots in the 19th century and some say its head in the sand. His parents understand that he must leave, but are unwilling to let him go. He's taken a job at Bevercoats Colliery in the East Midlands. The National Coal Board are paying removal costs because they want him to go. But no Ashington miner would willingly leave his hometown. I was worried a little bit because um, it was just finding another job. I mean, um, like leaving the pit, it's, it's just like leaving your wife, just going away. To me, like, I mean, I've worked with the, the men for a long time and um, just couldn't put it put two to get move away until we got put the wood on and um wasn't the hard work it was just the it's just the conditions and and what wage you were getting and i thought that shipping down the away out the area in the coal industry of course um would help a little bit would you have changed from mining to some other kind of employment if you could have done? Well, I tried, um, I went for, an in for two interviews to uh, commercial plastics and I never got, um, I never had any uh, answer from them seeing whether I had gotten, had a job or got a job or nothing. And I also, I rung up um, a paper firm that delivers papers around the area uh, if I could get a job on there and I was just told that I would have to wait because there was a list for people. You said that leaving the pit would be almost like leaving your wife. Did you not want to take some other kind of work? I didn't want... Um, I mean, work, working with the men was... Well, it was working with your best friends, as to say, and... Uh, 
I didn't want to come out the quarry, out, out the coal industry, because um, I think there's a good, there, there must be a good future in it somewhere, even if you've got to go way down south. On this house, £600 of their savings were spent before Alan and Shirley decided to move out. They can take their possessions, but not the improvements. Would they have stayed in Ashington if there had been any security, any certainty of work here? Oh, definitely. He's, he's tried for other jobs. Many jobs he's tried for, but there's nothing come up. And I mean, it's no good waiting and waiting. So we took the chance and said, right, this is it, we'll go now. Would you be willing for him to do some other kind of work than mining? Oh, yes, yes. I would like him to come about out of the pits altogether, really. Why? But um, I don't know. I, you've always got that uh, uncertainty, you know, when they're down there. But um, he's quite settled where he is now, so if he's settled, I'm settled. You've spent a lot of money on this house and put a lot of work into it. What's it like seeing it empty now for the last time? Well, it's a heartache, really, because we've really worked hard at it the past three years. I mean, we've stripped it all down. We've had new walls put in, bathroom and toilet put on, new fireplace put in, glass partition put on, all glass doors put through. We've really worked hard at it, you know. We've never stopped in the three years we've been in. Are you going to work as hard as this to make your new place pretty? Well, there won't be as much attached to it with it being a new house. You know, we'll have, there uh, won't be decoration to do, we won't have the paper or anything. So I assume we'll just move in and sort of get ourselves comfortable, you know. But uh, it's a heartache, this leaving it, but thinking to what I'm going, to what I had to come into, you know, it's a, it's a big difference. Ashington, of course, has been through bad times before, hasn't it? Do you think it'll ever come up again, or do you think it's on the way out now? Oh, I think it's on the way out, definitely. The house is all packed up, and it's practically time for you to say goodbye to Ashington now. Yes, sir. Are you glad to be going? Yes, really, because there isn't anything left in Ashington. There's nothing to stay for, you know. Um, as I said, I miss my friends and everything, but. As far as Ashington is concerned, I think I'll, uh, I won't miss it all that much. <laughs> the farewell party for Norman and Shirley in one of Ashington's social clubs. So few of the local people have ever thought of moving out that the departure of an Ashington family has something of the importance of a wedding or a funeral. It's still an occasion in the life of the village, not an everyday event as yet. Alan's mother finds it difficult to see him go from Ashington and the life she knows. He's worked hard at his house. He did want to make it, you know, nice. And, but just one of these things. You seem to me to be undecided as to whether it really is for the best or not. Well, there isn't really anything at all, no. But I'm going to miss him terribly. What do you think you'll miss most about them when they've gone? Well, they will. We look after Lynn. We? She likes to come to our house. She's right about in the car with me. Oh, proper chatterbox. Miss her. Worry about them, mostly. I don't know, I hope they get on all right, that. What do you think he will miss most? The life at home. He used to go to the hazards, and of course he'll not be able to go to them down there. And he's always doing something at home, helping us. He used to see to the car if I wanted anything done to it, and things like that. 
you know, has been happy, friendly, very yeah. friendly. Yeah. How much of a difference is it going to make to your life and your husband is going? Well, it'll seem empty. Yeah. I have a Darwin Joan Club, you know, and I make marmalade and jam, chutney and all sorts for that, but it still doesn't keep me occupied. And Lynn, I mean, she was always at home, New Begin. And there was something to do. I shall miss him terribly. Whatever the government's plans are at present to rationalise the mining industry, they couldn't be in more of a muddle than Shirley's plans for moving house from Ashington to the Midlands, for deciding what should go into the van last and come out first. The removal men, who've seen it all a hundred times before, systematically reduce the chaos of the house to a neatly stacked order in the back of the van. Suddenly, it's time to lock up the empty house and leave. on the skyline is the only familiar thing about the new place where the Normans have come to live. The new house on a new estate is surrounded by a sea of mud traversed by concrete paths like gangways. Children run amok here all too easily and fill the house with dirt. The men building the estate know more about the neighbourhood than the newcomers, most of whom have been here less than a week. The houses are not so solidly built as the one Shirley left in Ashington, but she hopes it will be more compact, whatever that may really mean, and easier to run. Beyond her own four walls and the familiar furniture, all resemblance to her hometown abruptly ceases. Though only about a hundred miles from Ashington, this place in terms of community life could be on the other side of the moon. Here there is no community as yet, merely the raw material. Good morning. I'm from next door and I wonder if you could say 
telling me whereabouts the nearest chaps are around here. Well, I haven't been here very long myself, but I do know my way about them a bit. Yeah. To find the shops, you go up that way and along the way and then round the next corner at the top. And there's uh, a little grocer's shop and uh, a hairdresser's next door to that. And it's a sort of ironmonger's store too, grocer's. And then there's a betting shop if you're interested in that. Yes, yes. And then further down the road a bit there's the post office, but it's more or less a, a post office general merchant shop too. And then on the main road, they've started to build a new supermarket that should be open shortly. What's wrong? Oh, it's just a very nice full of coal. She just can't be brought to one before you disappear. Oh, I've got a wee boy that you could play with. Is there many children around here? Well, it's been awfully bad weather since I came, and I haven't seen quite a lot, but I there's a couple of wee boys stays over there and I think there's a few in this bit. There's quite a lot of babies, I think. I've seen a few prams. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Say bye-bye to the ladies. Bye-bye. Thank you. Oh, you're a baby. Well, you're a baby. Say thank you and bye-bye. Thank you. Say bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Beverkirk's colliery, the most modern in Europe, bears less resemblance to an Ashington pit than Shirley's old house does to her new one. The first time Alan saw its trim lawns and well-kept pavements, he thought it looked more like a hospital than a coal mine. In his old Ashington pit, he had to walk in the rain from the changing rooms to the lamp cabin, from the time office to the shaft. At Beverkirk's, he's undercover all the way, though if the sun does happen to be shining, he'll miss that too in these steam-heated corridors. The most difficult part of the move is still to come for the Normans, in making the transition from the familiar, ordered life of an old-fashioned community like Ashington to the colder, more impersonal, but perhaps freer world of the modern industrial scene. In Ashington, England's biggest pit village, there are 26 social clubs and everybody knows everybody else. Here, a group of strangers happen to be employed in the same place for a time. It may not suit all of them or their wives. It certainly suits the coal board and the planners. The Sunday after the Normans left, prayers were being said at this mass in Ashington for John and Leela Kirkup and their children, themselves about to leave Ashington. Another family are leaving tomorrow. It is always sad to lose members of the parish, and we hope that they will settle down and find happiness in their new home, and we wish them every blessing. I'm sure that these families who leave Ashington will remember their close links with St. Aidan's Parish and the Ashington community. An Ashington man born and bred, John Kirkup has a Scottish wife and ten children. At 39, he's decided to leave Ashington, where he's been a surface worker for some years. The National Coal Board have retrained him and offered him a job in the pit at Bevercote's Colliery. When did you go? Tomorrow? Tomorrow Father. Well, God bless you, Lara. God bless you, John. And you've got all the kiddies into the school. Oh, that's absolutely marvellous. And you're near the church. It's about four hundred yards. What time are you going tomorrow? I've no idea. You don't know what time you're leaving yet. Well, I hope everything goes well with you. We're terribly sorry to lose you. Terribly sorry. But we'll hope you're very happy when you're going. Well, we'll, need, we'll need to go for them because, I mean, with ten children, I don't see any prospects of anything being last at all, really. Well, you've made the decision. It's a very well, courageous decision. And, and I hope everything goes well with you. Well, well, very sad at losing you all, you know. Very sad when you come back this way, will you call and see us? Yes, Father. Yes, Father. Yes, Father. Yes, There's no drink at this farewell party and no sing-song. But with ten kids in the family, there is a whole network of friendships with other children in the neighbourhood. And though parting with friends is always a sad occasion, there's nothing like a good meal to stay the pangs of hunger, if not of departure. The Kirkups have lived in this house for 17 years. What finally made them decide to go? Just on the spot of the moment, the employment uh, van, the NCB employment van, was standing beside the Universal, and we just went in the spot of the moment just to worry, to, 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 to see, and that was it. That was the, the move. I was moved in, uh, in say, three weeks. I had a job in, say, three weeks at Bevercoats. Not actually Bevercoats. I had to be sent for retraining. 
because the methods, uh, the, the, tip, the words they use in the uh, uh, dawn domain are different. Here we generally say, if a tub is running on an incline, we generally say we'll drag it, which is a wooden uh, implement made at the collie, which you push into the spokes of the wheel to stop it, it acts as a brake. But there, they use what they call lockers. It's the same principle, but different names. And different so terminology. Different that terminology. And that's why, uh, that's more or less, I think, the reason why uh, they want to go. No, no, that's four years since I was down the main, you see. Mrs. Kirkup runs her household with a mixture of affection and attention that takes up most of her working day. Does she look forward to the added burden of moving them all to a new house? Very much so. Why? Well, there again, just call it a woman's intuition. I can't explain it, but I feel very contented about it. Because John has been away six weeks. It's the first time uh, he's been away from home. And he settled down very well. Of course, he likes his work. And I think if a man likes his job, he's happy in his work, he's happy at home. Well, eight times out of ten, I should imagine. Do you think you'll miss anything about Ashington? Well... Miss anything? Hmm. I don't know. No, oh, I have a few friends I'll miss. But, um... If they're real friends, they understand why we're moving. And I mean, they all have cars so they can come and see us. So, no, I don't think so. So the idea of packing up ten children and the house after 17 years and moving away holds no terrors for you at all? None. None. None whatsoever. Um, I mean, I've had to pack up. This will be the third time. And I hope it's that time lucky. Why, has it not been very, very lucky from that point of view in Ashington? Has it not been an easy spell here? Um, just about the past two years, I think. Everything's gone wrong. What do you feel about the situation, though, that your husband has worked here most of his, most of his adult life? Um... Do you at all resent the fact that he's suddenly told, well, you'd better go somewhere else, you're not wanted here anymore? Well, I do in a way. And yet, I don't. I do because, um... I think it's a bit hard that a man should have to go out of the area to get alternative employment. But the way things are here, if he wants to provide for his family, he must go. He'll have to go. And sooner or later, even those who are reluctant to go now, will have to go. But, I mean, if a man wants to work to provide for his family, he must move out the area. And this is wrong. All wrong. But what can you do? You must go. You say it's wrong very firmly, uh, as though you're absolutely convinced that this is so. Uh, what is fundamentally wrong about it, do you think? Well, it's just more or less like what I said before. I mean, uh, this area was booming at one time. But lately, it has slowly gone downhill. And neither one government nor the other has lifted a hand to help it. On the way. But what can poor mortals like us do? We're not in Whitehall. We've just got to be them. So, you got to move. Or live in the government. And I think I'd rather die first. How much would you make drawing unemployment benefit, for example, with the family or side? Well, I've never actually inquired from the... Uh, unemployment office, but uh, from what they say, we should have had about £23 a week, which would have been very nice. And is that more than your husband was bringing back? Oh, what he was earning here? Oh, why? I'll say. By a long way. But... So it cost you money to work? Hmm? It cost you money for him to be in work? Yes. Why did he go on working? Well, those old-fashioned things called principles. Which ones in particular applied in his case? Well, he has ten children. It's his duty to work and keep them, not the state. 
And no matter how little the income is, it will keep them. And it does. You share this view? Yes. Because you can hold your head up when you go out. And you don't uh, have to bother if people say, oh, look at that one, that one's on national assistance, that look what they've got, look what they haven't got. I don't have to bother. Anything I got, my husband worked for. You see? How much does that matter to you? A great deal, really, at the bottom of me. It's a struggle. I think I enjoy it, to tell you the truth. I mean, we're happy. And all the money in the world couldn't buy that. I think that goes a long way. The National Coal Board are prepared to pay the cost of moving house and to help as best they can in every way. But sometimes details do get overlooked. Hello, John Thompson. Hello. Uh, Mrs. Kirkup from Ashington, please. Oh, I, I don't think I'll get cut off. No, it's just a local call. I'm phoning from Ashington. Right. Oh, what time will he be back? Well, I'm in a quandary here now. Are you? Have you something to do with manpower? Yeah, well, I'll try. Now, we are moving here from Ashington to Harworth. My husband has been transferred to Bevercoats Colliery. Now, I've been informed that there's nowhere for us to sleep tonight. Now, the furniture goes away. Now, what do we do when we get to the other end? Do we just go into an empty house and stay there for the night? Till the van comes back in the morning or what? I mean, I've got ten children to think about. It's all right saying, don't worry yourself or get upset. But, I mean, after all, these arrangements would have been taken care of. Well, do you think the trouble's been the other end? Because my husband hasn't been informed of one thing, you know. Mrs. Kirkup has in her voice a cutting edge of sarcasm which she sharpens daily on her large brood, and if necessary, she's perfectly prepared to use it on the coal board's officials. All right, then. I'll just leave it at that, then, will I? Thank you, then. Bye-bye. <laughs>